All right, you are live. live. We are live. Ooh. Sorry. <laughs> welcome everybody to the Justin and Caitlin show. Woo. Hey, welcome to episode 15 of our show. That's pretty cool. And episode yeah. six in our attachment series, which is a special one on attachment and sex. Today, mm -hmm. Caitlin is going to be interviewing me and a special guest. <laughs> <laughs> we'll pretend that the whole last yeah, okay, there we go. So, good guys, tonight our special guest is Andrea. She is Justin's amazing wife and also our clinical director here at Phoenix. For those of you that do not know her, she has a lot of Facebook lives. So, you most likely have seen her before. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Just as a little heads up for everyone, um, we will be doing our regular 30 minute show on this. If you guys have any questions, feel free to comment them below and then we can go through them after the 30 minutes. That way, if anyone needs to go ahead and jump off after the main three questions are answered, you don't have to sit through all the others. But tonight we will be asking Justin and Andrea three big questions when it comes to sex and attachment. But I know Andrea, you had mentioned you wanted to give a little bit of perspective on why we're approaching this the way we are tonight and how mm -hmm. come we're focusing on it like that. So why don't you go ahead and jump in? Yeah, um, I want to refer to the quote that you posted on Instagram earlier, um, where I said, you know, sex is meant to be super glue, but when you have attachment wounds in the mix, it's like lighting dynamite, right? Yeah. And so that's kind of where we're coming from tonight is really looking at sex from the standpoint of intimacy. So we're not here to talk about like great sex techniques <laughs> or ways to do this <laughs> differently. <laughs> Um, we're really looking at the aspect of intimacy and connection mm -hmm. because that's where attachment style really matters yeah. and changes so much. And you yeah. had like a great perspective yeah. too. And just going with Andrew, this isn't the this isn't the magazine Cosmo here with the forty seven mm -hmm. greatest sex tips. Okay, <laughs> we'll do that <laughs> some other day. Um, <laughs> but uh, a quote that was given to me by my mentor, and he's my clinical supervisor. He said, "Look." Sex is the ultimate form of connection and communication mm -hmm. for a couple. So those of you who've been watching our shows the last uh, five weeks mm -hmm. realize there's some core fears, and we're going to touch on them here in, in a little bit. We're going to jump in these questions. But I want you to realize if we believe, and this is what we're going with, that sex is the ultimate form, the super glue of connection and uh, communication, why this would be so triggering. Um, and so, yeah, Caitlin, you want to set yeah. us on down the road? <laughs> so to kind of build a foundation for tonight, what do each of the attachment styles look like when it comes to their own individual sexual mindset? So wherever you guys want to start with that, um, but just really form that foundation for us. Sure. And in the effort of consistency, which is a huge deal for attachment <laughs> work, uh, those of you out there. Uh, we started our series on doing ambivalent, avoidant, mm -hmm. disorganized. And so we're going to follow that same trajectory through these questions. And then we're going to end tonight with the secure, how do we kind of work through some things. And we're going to be sharing stories along the way like we usually do. So just so you have a little bit of a where we're going. Uh, so we'll start. Ambivalent style. They believe that they are not sexually desirable. Uh, they tend to be you know, more submissive in this and they tend to feel like they have to dress more provocatively or work on their body more in order to entice others, you know, to come along for the journey. Now, remember, and we're going to harp on this through the whole show, the primary fear of ambivalent attachment style is abandonment. You could put a little sidebar of rejection. So you can imagine how that plays into the idea of sex. A lot of the ambivalent attachments, um, behavior center around the idea of how can I attract and retain said sexual partner? And we'll get into this in the next question, but they'll do it at almost any cost, which really sets them up for a, a tough road. Uh, the next style <clears throat> is the avoidant attachment style. Now, these people like we've talked about, they believe they're worthy of love and they believe they're worthy of sex. They just don't feel like involving other people in the adventure. <laughs> They're like, hey, man, I can handle this on my own. I don't know why I need to incorporate all this complicated love stuff. <laughs> and remember, you know, I say a little jokingly, but the core fear of the avoidant attachment style is intimacy. 
And so again, if sex is the ultimate form of connection and commu uh, communication, it is thereby one of the ultimate forms of intimacy, which, nah. Mm -hmm. And we'll get into how people in avoidance style can, you know, unhealthy ways they avoid um, engaging mm -hmm. in sex. But Andrew, you take us down the road of disorganized. Yeah, so the disorganized attachment mindset towards sex. Um, and of course, guys, let me just kind of clarify really quickly. None of this is like absolutes right so we're right. throwing out trends we're throwing out like general patterns right. but no human being ever fits into a box so please don't take this as like some kind of gospel of, this is judgment style this is exactly what you're going to see no <laughs> these are just some of the, trends and the patterns that you might see based on the attachment style right so the disorganized believes that they're they also believes they're not sexually desirable, right? And, and so you will see a couple of different things manifest with them oftentimes. Either I have to manipulate others in order to get sexual pleasure, or I figure out how I have to protect myself by weaponizing sex, mm -hmm. right? And so you might see both of those things playing out in their relationships, or you might see them alternating from relationship to relationship and using different, you know, uh, methodologies, depending on what's going on. Um, sexual trauma, for a lot of times, people with a disorganized um, attachment style, they kind of expect it to happen. That's just the way it is. And so, unfortunately, you do see a lot of that in their background. Mm. So with that foundation, guys, what does this look like then in the context of a relationship? So again, not just a sexual mindset, but now actually having to engage with someone else before, during, and after this whole escapade happens. Oh, what does that really look like? Ramping up now, aren't we? <laughs> yeah, we are. <laughs> Jumping so, right into the deep end. Again, you know, we're going to start with our same flow, ambivalent, avoid, and disorganized. Um, and to Andrew's point, like we've talked about in previous mm -hmm. shows, usually we're a mixture of mm -hmm. a couple yeah. of these. That's mm -hmm. not all. Um, and that's okay. And that's normal and it's cool. So if you connect with a couple, awesome. That's normal. Um, so ambivalent. Again, we're going back to what I said a little bit ago. They don't feel worthy of the love. They don't feel worthy of sex. Um, so they're not. And again, their core fear is what? Abandonment and rejection. So they're not going to be very inclined to share what their needs or desires are sexually. They're going to be more inclined to submit to whatever their partner wants to do. Even at the expense of their boundaries getting toppled over. Uh, you can see how this can lead to, again, a, not a good recipe of outcomes where we get mm -hmm. feeling like, oh man, I don't really want to do this position or I don't want to include that sex toy or I don't want to do this or that or I don't want to bring in other people to this dynamic. But I'm terrified to lose my partner. So I better just go along with it so that I don't lose, you know, him or her, depending on whatever the scenario. And so it, it feels, it's terrifying, you know, because you don't want to do the thing, whatever that is. But you're also probably even more so terrified to verbalize and have your partner go, well, fine, if you don't want to do it, I'll find someone else, bye. Because that just hits your heart at a core level, and you're like, I don't want that pain. I'm not going to go there. Um, and Andrea, you have a life story. Yeah, I can really relate to this approach. You know, as I look back on my own story, I got married very young, very little sense of self, um, long story with that. And so, and also too, going into marriage with this idea of wanting so badly to be chosen and not feeling like that was a sure thing. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to go along then. And so even before we got married, I found myself going along with things <laughs> that I wasn't really um, in agreement with because, you know, I wanted this person to be happy. I wanted them to choose me. I wanted, you know, to have this happily ever after story, you know, be mine. And so that's how I entered into it. And looking back now, I can see the clear ambivalent attachment style that, that's behind that. And then over the years, that just compounded and got worse because 
I consistently didn't voice, well, first of all, half the time didn't know what was going on, you know, internally for myself. So how am I going to communicate that to anybody else? So I'm not communicating. I'm going along with things because I feel like that's what I should be doing. Mm -hmm. Not necessarily because I'm going to be rejected or abandoned, maybe, or of course there was a little bit of that, but more so from the sense of, well, I'm supposed to, I'm a wife, this is what we do. And then perpetuating this cycle then where I don't feel safe because I'm engaging in something that's deeply intimate mm. that is not comfortable for me. I'm crossing lines or boundaries that I don't really feel comfortable with. So I'm creating this vicious cycle. And then the other thing that I noticed too, going to what you said about avoiding is that, you know, I look back on my body during those years and I gained a tremendous amount of weight during those years and part of me really feels like some of that was a way to avoid sex. It was kind of like almost creating this barrier between me and this other person to create some safety. And so it's amazing how subconsciously we'll do all kinds of things to try to avoid engaging this thing that has become a source of feeling very like not okay, not safe. So I can totally relate to this um, style. Moving to the avoidance style, um, how that plays out in relationships. Again, going back to what you were saying about there, it's all about avoiding intimacy, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so sex can become superficial. Mm -hmm. um, it's focused more on the orgasm and not mm -hmm. on the connection. Um, sometimes you'll see um, uh, a, a dominant style in this attachment because again, being in a dominant role or engaging in dominant styles of sex allows the sex to, to remain disconnected, to remain yeah. distant, and they can kind of stay in that position of power and power control. And control yeah. um, porn can be a very common dynamic in this attachment style because again, remember, if I can leave other people out of the equation and not get into this messy relationship thing... <laughs> You know, yeah. little, um, you know, this is this is seen as kind of a win. So, um, yeah, so that that's where you'll see. So I think the word that stands out to me when I think about the relational dynamic for sex with the avoidant attachment is is detachment. You know, whatever we can do to kind of create this detachment from the other person is what you're going to see a lot of times with this style. And then finally, with disorganized, again, going back to what I was saying earlier about the mindset, unfortunately, you're going to often see sexual abusive relationships in um, with the disorganized attachment style, because there's just some really dysfunctional engagements that they're going into it with. And so kind of like it's this recipe um, for dysfunction and abuse. Or the other dynamic that you'll see is that they've figured out how to use sex to get the power, the control, the perks, or the sense of safety that they need. Um, because again, I don't trust myself and I don't trust others. So I have to figure out ways to kind of like feel safe and to be safe. So sometimes sex becomes that tool. And so again, you can see one or, or both of these dynamics happening in relationships depending on the relationship, the dynamics of the relationship itself. Yeah. Um, so sex can vary between being submissive or dominant, mm -hmm. depending on what dynamic they're channeling at the time um, or with that person. Um, and you can see some of the same subconscious avoidance activities going on, whether it's getting really caught up in work or, mm -hmm. you know, whatever, the million and one tactics that we find to avoid sex without even realizing it because they have this intense crippling fear of rejection or they are afraid of being harmed because unfortunately there's a history of that. So, mm. so some of you are like, wow, Andrew shared a story. When's it Justin's turn? Right now. Here we are. <laughs> um, you know, I, I grew up in New Jersey. I grew up on the Jersey shore. I was a lifeguard at the beach at the Jersey shore. Uh, you know, and so I, I did behind the scenes live the life of a rock star on paper, you know, the sex, drugs, rock and roll, the clubs and all the things. And uh, for me, sex was terrifying, you know, because my attachment flare ups and intensity of the symptoms were so much that so much of the time I needed to be stoned, drunk or both to really engage. And that's when I felt comfortable and that it was okay. 
You know, there was times even in the relationship, I literally sat around going, well, if I can say hi the whole time, I think I can get through this relationship. And obviously you're going, well, that's not really possible. That's really expensive. But, <laughs> but you know, sex for me was terrifying. And I would have to fixate on the idea that it would be a great story to tell the fellas, you know, whether it's at the beach or my, you know, I'm saying a lifeguard year round in New Jersey, we have winter, um, you know, or a great story to tell my friends. And that's why I would do it. There was such a cultural context to what was pushing me, even though I did not really, I, I'll be honest, I never really felt safe and like totally cool with sex. Again, unless there was a substance involved was when I would feel the most okay. Um, and then even in the sex, I'd be distracted, like, oh, man, am I doing this right? Am I going? Am I good? Am I doing blah, 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 blah? And then I was like, just just hurry up and get, get to orgasm. And those of you who are younger guys, you know that can happen really fast. So this, you know, let's be honest. So, um, but yeah, the whole idea of sex was so chaotic because it was something that, like, yeah, testosterone's high, teens, early 20s especially, I mean, continuing now, but... So you feel that drive, culturally speaking, being on a beach, it's very sexual. You know, you're literally working at the beach where I'm wearing board shorts and all the guys, you know, you're wearing board shorts and the women are in like two piece bikinis or one pieces. And I feel like if you haven't noticed, bathing suits are getting smaller and less material, but somehow more expensive. I don't understand Sad that. But, Sad um, you know, so you're basically looking at people all day in lingerie. So your mind is like, oh, I, this is great. You know, I should be involved. But then when the moment comes, you're like, mm -hmm. oh, crap. Attachment reaction. Where's my yeah. Captain Morgan? Mm -hmm. You know, the captain will make it happen, right? All right. <laughs> All right. So, <laughs> All right. so yeah. but yeah, honestly, man, that was my motto. And I, this was something that helped get me through. And again, I'm not saying this is a good thing. This is, this is a horrible thing. If I literally would get myself in some of these situations and the only thing that would push me through was, will this be a good story in the morning? Yes? All right. I will deny all my anxiety, all my bells and whistles and red lights going off because it would be a good story in the morning. Even though I was like a 10 out of 10 with my anxiety, I was like freaking out. Um, you know, obviously, we talked about the disorganized show. We talked about, you know, in my ambivalence, too. You know, it, it came from a lot of horrific, not cool things mm -hmm. way earlier on in my life. Mm -hmm. But again, the idea of being intimate with somebody mm -hmm. meant, meant I, I stand a chance to get horribly wounded. Mm -hmm. And, buddy, I've already been through so much. Yep. I don't want that risk again. I don't want the risk and that R word is important as we transition to the secure side of this. But, you know, that, that was really my story, man. It was all about, you know, being high and drunk. And the nights I was sober, it was just, just, just power through this. It'll be a great story. Um, or, you know, I'm doing my duty in a relationship. Yeah. You know, and that's, that's how I started my journey. Yeah, and thank you guys for being so vulnerable there. Because a lot of times it's easy to kind of ghost over and do bullet points of like, oh, okay, this is what the attachment style looks like, blah, 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 and using someone else's story. But it's hard to sit there sometimes and really be vulnerable and say, this is where I used to be. I think, Justin, you always say this quote. It's like, we as therapists don't have an S in our chest. We all have our stories. We all come from somewhere. And it's usually through walking through our own stories and healing that we're able then to walk through other people's stories with them. Mm -hmm. And so I know on my end, not being married, it is great hearing your guys' stories and seeing the healing and the redemption that comes through that and seeing that this really is possible. And again, there is that hope. And so jumping on that then, looking at this now in a earned secure way, where do we go from here? So for people who have identified with one of these three and they're like, that's me, yeah. what's the next steps? Yeah, that's that's <laughs> yeah, that's where we that's where we end. <laughs> yeah, and I want to put it out there. Yeah, I mean that's how we end the show. Not <laughs> um, you know. Sorry, I, want, I want to put this out there. You know, and, and I'm going to actually use age forty because I know a lot of people feel pressure to be married by thirty. 
and that doesn't always happen. So there's, there's shame that gets tied. So I'm going to use age 40 for a reason. Let's pretend you're going to get married by age 40. And let's say your husband or wife, whoever, is the same age. Ideally, if things play out accordingly, and you all live 80, 90, whatever, you'll be married 40 to 50 years. Let's just say 50 again for easy math for us out there. With that said, um, <laughs> play the long game. Mm -hmm. Stop feeling so rushed. And you heard about me and how much that cultural aspect has such a grip on me. If it take, I'm making these numbers up. Could be longer or shorter. I don't care. If it takes you six months as a newly wedded couple to really rework through some things, again, this could be a year. Who cares? To learn how to touch each other, to lay naked, to be okay with, you know, hands and, and places and, and whatever. It's better to do that and have 49 and a half years of healthy, good sex than to bulldoze your way through your first six months or less, let's be honest. But we'll just be generous in saying six months. Bulldoze your way through six months of sex without doing some of what we're talking about and then having 49 and a half years of little to none sexual activity. Mm -hmm. Play Which is super common, actually. Yeah, it's really common with couples, man. Play the long game and be okay with that. Realize if you're going to be married, Play the idea that you're going to stay married, be committed to the marriage, mm -hmm. and also realize, you know, if we make it to 80, that's 40 years. Mm -hmm. We would have 39 plus years of, of sex if we can slow it down, if mm -hmm. we have stuff to work through. Yep. So keep that in mind as we Try break some through. of this down. Yeah. So I'm going to start with the people who aren't in a relationship. You know, Good they're point. like, they're listening to this going, okay, that explains a lot about my history, you know, mm -hmm. and they're listening to some of these attachment styles and it's bringing some enlightenment, some understanding, and they're going, oh, okay, I see where this was going yeah. wrong. And so now you're like, okay, now what? What do I, what can I do? I'm not in a relationship. I don't want to be in a relationship, especially now that I've heard this and I realize I got some work to do. So what can I do? So there are mm -hmm. a lot of things. In fact, Sometimes in working with couples, if we're doing, you know, if we have a couple that comes in and wants to do some work on the relationship, we may end up actually doing some individual work with each of yeah. them first before we even jump into the marriage work. Because some of this stuff that I'm about to share with you is such important groundwork. If that's mm -hmm. not in place, we can sit there and do those couple sessions forever, but it's not going to go anywhere, you Correct. know? So individually, what can we do? First of all, I want to send you back to last week's episode on the earned secure attachment. That's foundational. So going back and understanding what it takes to work towards your own individual earned secure attachment style is the foundation. That's where you can start. And you can do so much with that just right on your own. So I would encourage you to start there. Um, then that will take you then into understanding what it means to have self-love and to understand who you are and mm. what's going on. You know, what is it that you are passionate about? What do you care about? Who are you? What is your truth? Um, another thing that you can do individually is some of the somatic trauma work. Okay. So addressing some of the body's sensory responses to trauma especially touch. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So if touch has been really compromised for you because of trauma in your history, whether it's sexual trauma or other kinds of trauma, how in the world are you going to engage healthy sexuality if your body is screaming every time touch yeah. comes into the equation? So that's something that you can be working on now, you know, before you ever get into a relationship. Mm -hmm. Um, working on detaching from all of the sexual intimacy substitutes that we build into our lives, right? So whether it's pornography or workaholism or whatever it is, we find substitutes mm -hmm. for intimacy. All of us are very good at this. Mm -hmm. um, and so looking around your life and determining what, what have I put in place of that and doing the work to start detaching from all of that. Again, if you can do all of this before you're ever in a relationship, hello, awesome. And then here's a big one. 
working on the relationship with your own body, yeah. understanding your own sexual response cycle. Okay. All right. Masturbation. That's a whole conversation for a whole nother show. Um, self-touch, you know, figuring out your own body's reactions to things. That is a whole complicated subject. And there's a lot of opinions and thoughts, especially within the faith community about what's, what that's all about, but somehow, some way, whatever is comfortable for each individual's set of personal beliefs, we have to figure out our own bodies. How in the world am I going to communicate to a partner mm -hmm. what it is that I need, how my body works, if I haven't even taken the time to figure that out, right? So that's stuff that we can be doing when we are um, on our own. And then finally, working on our communication skills. Again, we said at the beginning, we started with this idea that it's about communication. Well, if my communication skills are not good, and come on, let's be real, guys, none of us, you know, hardly any of us, I should say, I should never say never, <laughs> always, none, whatever. Um, most of us That's are funny. not growing up, never say never. In your statement, you said. I know, I know, I love it. <laughs> um, most of us are not growing up in context where we're being taught good communication skills. So this True. is no diss on anybody. You're like, we're all in this boat together. We all get to a point in our adulthood where we realize, okay, I'm going to now have to go back and be intentional about learning how to communicate well. So that is something that you can be working on right now. So moving forward, all those things are, are ideally done when we are on our own and we can really kind of work through those without distraction. And then moving forward to the next level of healing requires a relationship, but not just any relationship, it requires a secure relationship. And that's why we kind of really focused a lot of our conversation tonight on marriage, because if you are going to do this work of really healing your sexual relationship through your attachment style, it is terrifying. It is difficult. And personally, we really don't feel, believe it's going to be successful outside the context of a secure relationship where you can feel safe that this person is in it for the long haul, is going to walk through this wilderness with you, is not going to abandon you or leave you right. as you are trying to work on all of these difficult things. So yeah. once you're in that. So once you've navigated your way into a relationship that is healthy and growing, and, and again, forget the idea of being perfect, but it's healthy and it's growing and you guys are talking, having crucial conversations, we actually, uh, during our dating phase and being engaged, <clears throat> we actually scheduled um, like days, you know, I think it was two days a month or something on like a Friday. Look, we're going to talk about sex. And that could be about our histories. It could be our, about our fears. It could be about expectations, thoughts. What do we think it's going to be? How are we going to engage? What is this? What is that? What are you willing to do? What are you not willing to do? Um and then when we don't agree on certain things, like, well, I think we should do it. You know, the classic struggle that goes on with couples is one partner wants to do it more than the other. Well, we have to find some way for us to meet in the middle-ish. How can we talk through that? Mm -hmm. How can we learn to create a safe space so that we're able to move into that, you know, mm -hmm. where where that person who made us want to do it as much is like, okay, well, I feel confident enough and I trust you that I, I, I will risk it and I will go. Again, remember, we talked about this in our secure attachment video. Risk. When you believe that the person is not going to leave you, that they're there with you through the long haul, you can trust them to love you, you feel loved by them, and you feel these things inside about yourself, man, you're able to risk. Mm -hmm. And it's okay. And it doesn't need to go right all the time. Um, and you can have these, quite honestly, very vulnerable conversations. You know, um, uh, what was I going to say? Um, debating which one I want to go to first. But uh, the idea here of learning how to engage each other and taking baby steps. Remember, play the long game. Okay. You know, and I'll be honest, sometimes, fellas, this is on us. You know, we get a little bit one track. Okay. You know, some of us, that's how we're wired. It is what it is. 
But we got to remember there's two people in play here. It's not just about us. Your wife may be coming to you saying, I don't feel safe. Well, because when she senses that it's all about the orgasm, it becomes feeling like a vending machine. Mm. You know, we've got to learn to connect. Can we just lay naked with our spouse and let it be there? Can we leave it at, at hands? You know, manual stimulation, whether of self or each other. Moving into oral sex and then sex. Can we be okay with these baby steps? And if we have a hiccup, which you're going to, hate to be the bubble burster. <laughs> okay, what happened there? Let's mm -hmm. talk about it. This is what Andrea is talking about with the communication factor. Mm -hmm. Now, a lot of people, and Andrea referenced this multiple times already, porn. And ladies, this is a lady issue as well. Okay, ladies are actually the leading uh, growing demographic in porn use. Typically driven at males, and males are still the highest percentage, but women are growing uh, in porn usage. Understand there's a lot of fears that come in this. One of the perpetual age-old issues for males is, is my penis big enough? Am I going to stimulate her? Am I going to be good enough for her? And if you have a history of watching porn, let's be honest, all the guys on there um, are freakishly sized, all right? Now, what we don't see behind the scenes is a lot of times they're taking different drugs and different things that pump them up, make them look a certain way. But we, especially in our United States culture, train to believe that our body is everything. Mm -hmm. So as a guy, we go in feeling like, man, I should have a 27-pack of abs and a huge penis. But really, I'm coming in with a dad bod and you know, whatever. <laughs> and women, you know, yeah. it, Women can feel very, you know, like, I don't live up to that. I don't have this hourglass figure. I don't have the big fake boobs. I don't have all the makeup and airbrushing mm -hmm. and a perfect wax job and all the things. And you're going, well, holy crap, if, if you've watched porn, you know, then how am I supposed to get you turned on? Because I don't look nothing like this. Mm -hmm. These are conversations that need to happen. These are conversations that are pivotal to the relationship growing to, again, the idea here, have the tough convos. The tough convos give you the fertile ground to build a healthy, long-term sex life. Mm -hmm. The goal is not to have sex your first year of marriage and then mail it in. Which is unfortunately what is happening a lot. Yeah. And just quickly to circle back to where we started, you know, just again, sharing our story a little bit, you know, we made the decision throughout our dating and engagement not to have sex until we got married because we wanted to force ourselves to actually do all of this work. Because mm -hmm. remember, sex is super glue, right? So once you have sex, then it makes it so much easier to sort of like smooth over all that other stuff. Mm -hmm. And so we, because we didn't have that to fall back on, we had to have these conversations. We had to talk through very specifically, what are we expecting? What do we think this is going to look like? What is it that we want out of this? What is it that, you know, is in our histories that may be hindering, you know, our sex life? And then working through, like you said, the baby steps, learning how to be with each other and just be physically touching and engaging and understanding each other's bodies without falling back on that easy fix. Mm -hmm. um, so that for us was our, our journey. Like it looks different for everybody, but for us, that was just uh, a decision that we were very intentional about and very faithful to. So, and I am very grateful. Yeah. And, and even with that, it's not like, because we had all these long, many conversations beforehand that everything was just honky dory. We got married and it's been just roses and sunshine, leprechauns and pink elephants. There better not be uh, leprechauns. <laughs> that's only when you're on hallucinogenics. But hey, don't do those either. Um, but in that, you know, I mean, I'll, I'll remember too, like for me, I know when I am, you know, we use the word triggered a lot. People don't like that word anymore and they get annoyed because it gets overused. Mm -hmm. You know, whatever. 
But I had to realize like, if I had a really hard day with clients or there's a lot going on in my life, again, remember, oh, this is weird, so I don't know, this is S or it's an R, <laughs> but we don't have issues on our chest. You know, I've got a grandma right now that's in the hospital dying. I've got an uncle in the hospital right now who who is really in bad shape, okay? I've got things going on in my life, you know, and I'm navigating all of this. And then some days after seeing clients all day, getting calls, texts, and reports from back, you know, family in New Jersey, they're not good. You know, you start wanting to avoid, you know, intimacy with, with uh, you know, for me, my wife. And I've noticed, you know, there was a couple of times where I noticed that I overate. And I didn't realize it till it's too late. But it was subconscious as overeating so that I would feel like kind of that food coma-y, like kind of useless state. But I realized, I'm like, oh, dang, I did that because I was avoiding wanting to be intimate and connect. And there's these very subtle things to be aware of. If you catch yourself playing a crap ton of video games, you start noticing that you start smoking weed and then a lot more. Or you start um, binge watching more and more shows. Ask yourself, where is this Mm -hmm. coming from? What am I avoiding? Why is it that when my wife or my husband is in their bedroom, I'm like, hey, I'm going to go watch 19 episodes of, you know, I shouldn't be alive, you know, <laughs> or, you know, I shrub truckers. Um, I, I did that during the COVID thing. But, uh, <laughs> but you know, it's it's honest. You, you got to yeah. ask these questions. You got to be willing to dive into. And then what I, here's the, here's the big challenge, fellas. I'm big on this because a lot of us ain't been trained. A lot of us ain't been taught to engage emotions other than what's the big one we go to? Anger. Woo. (laughs) No, that's crap. You know, and a lot of us didn't have dads to pour into us. And that's not an excuse. So that's a big part of therapy. I like to do is to help fellas learn to engage the emotion wheel. You know, it's okay to admit that you're sad. It's okay to admit you're embarrassed. It's okay to admit whatever. You're happy, your your joy, you know, whatever the deal. You know, and so for me, it's being vulnerable, going to Andrew and going, you know, I've realized I have had it really rough lately and I feel unsettled and, and all these things. And I've noticed that it's caused me to like want to disconnect from you or disengage you in some way. And you're gonna have to figure yourself out. And that's where therapy comes in. That all of us work from the same model. This is where this whole getting this picture together, this is where you're able to have much deeper conversations because you understand how you got here. Your story makes sense to why you do what you do. And you're able to start changing things, which, you know, we begin a healthier journey. But this also gives me the keys to have much stronger conversations Mm -hmm. with Andrea and vice versa, because she's done the same rodeo, you know, Mm -hmm. she can share more. Like, you know, I really was whatever. And that's how this therapy really ties into the depth of your marriage, your connection, your even Mm -hmm. beyond marriage, to be honest, your friendships. You're able to have different conversations. You're able to deepen and connect further and change that relational history, Mm -hmm. you know, where people do stay around more. Mm -hmm. Um, And so, yeah. If anybody's got any questions, you can throw them up in the comments section and we'll wait a minute or two. Um, but yeah, I mean, this is kind of the end of the show. Show this is the Q and A part. <laughs> charge thirty seven dollars per question. Just kidding. Um, but yeah, we'll, we'll wait a minute. But Caitlin, you want to wrap the show part up? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'll just say thank you, Andrea, for joining us. This has been you're welcome. Very, very good, and just diving again a lot deeper. A lot of times, again, we do the bullet points of this is what attachment looks like. And there isn't really this process of what does it actually look like to work through this? Mm-hmm. What does it look like when you've had a sexual history that hasn't been great? And now mm-hmm. these other attachment styles are being, again, it's like dynamite. They're exploding yeah. in yeah. the relationship and you don't know what to do. And there is that sense of confusion and chaos and almost like a lack of answers where yeah. to go so thank you guys because that was great and actually providing some outlines some groundwork where we can actually start yeah thank you it's 
definitely something that I think all three of us see so yep. commonly. I think yeah. it's surprising to me how disconnected people's <laughs> sexuality is. Like they'll come into counseling for this, that, or the other thing. And then as a counselor, when we start asking questions and start mm -hmm. exploring, lo and behold, there's a whole thing going on in, yeah. you know, the sexual arena. And so, um, I think that's something that we're all passionate about is creating a safe space for people to actually look at that and then integrate that into the rest of their lives so that there's really so much more health and, and, um, you know, yeah, enjoyment and sacredness to that part of, yeah. of their lives. So. And I think too, like a quick, quick thing out to the males out there. Um, you know, I've spoken for enough about my story and I'll tell you, most of the males that I have seen have had some type of sexual trauma where they were molested mm -hmm. as a kid, raped, mm -hmm. uh, incest, any combination or one of those. It's a lot more common than a lot of times those guys don't want to admit it. Again, there's a lot of mm -hmm. cultural aspects of that. And we don't feel like we'll be believed. We don't feel like we'll be seen as tough or masculine or whatever. I can't be a victim. I don't want to be a victim. I don't want to be this. Look, man, it happens a lot more than you realize. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And I'll just tell you, it's uh, it's a real thing. Um, I'm passionate about helping fellows work through that because mm -hmm. we, we hold it in, we hold it in, but it manifests mm -hmm. outwardly, you know, in our sex life. Yeah. There's different issues that come about because of that. Um, and it's healable, you know. And shoot, mm -hmm. I tell, I don't necessarily tell clients this. I mean, maybe now, but... You know, shoot, man, if, if I can change and come from where the hell I came from, <laughs> so there is hope for a, a lot of people out there. <laughs> hey, <laughs> you know, but, you know, just thank you for everybody tuning in, chiming in. I don't see any questions, comments, complaints, or concerns yet. Good. Yeah, um, we're good. We're good. Send any complaints <laughs> to Caitlin's email. Wow. <laughs> But join us next wow. week as we start a new series or a little mini spot, actually. Um, and I'm going to leave you in suspense, partially mm -hmm. because I haven't finalized it with Caitlin. But so, <laughs> what are you about to announce? Right right Caitlin's like, wait, look. what? Yeah. Wait a second. Um, what are we doing? But thank you all. We'll see you next week, next Wednesday yes. at 730. Bye. See yeah. that? That's, that's, that's magic. That's my goodbye. <laughs>